Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your holy word. We pray that it might be a lamp to our feet, a light to our paths, and strength to our lives. We pray that you would speak to us as we think about your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I won't be here next week for Bruce's farewell, so I'm thankful to Bruce for all he's done, and especially for inviting me to preach from time to time. And I will be here on Tuesday for our Bible study, but I'm going to Caloundra for two weeks on Friday. And when I preach, I don't always preach as somebody else, but today I'm doing it again. I'm not sure you can understand how distressing it was for me. It had been years and years. I'd prayed and prayed and still no sign of a child. What was the Lord our God doing? Like any other woman, I wanted to be a mother and to present my husband with a child. Wasn't that why he married me? Children, especially sons, were so important to the future. And who was I without a son? I managed to cope most of the time. But sometimes my pain and longing were almost more than I could bear. The worst time for me was when we went up to Shiloh, the place where all the people from the countryside gathered to worship the Lord. Elkanah, my husband, arranged for us to go there every year. By we, I don't just mean the two of us, but also Penina and her children. Panina was Elkanah's second wife. Panina had children, and I had no children. Just being there together with Panina and her children was painful enough, but she always seemed to be gloating over her fertility and my infertility. She did everything she could to get on my nerves. Maybe she was like this because she knew I was Alcana's favourite wife, the one he loved most. That time at Shiloh, the whole thing got to me more than ever. My dear husband knew how unhappy I was. I know he was trying to help, but he only made things worse for me. After the sacrifice was offered, we ate some of the meat in the Thanksgiving meal together. Elkanah gave Panina her share and some to all her sons and daughters. Then he gave me my serving, which was twice as much as he gave everyone else. You can imagine how Panina went on about that. I burst into tears and wept. I couldn't eat a thing. My husband didn't understand what I was crying about. Why are you weeping, he said. Why don't you eat? Why are you so sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? How could the man say that? Didn't he understand? How could he tell me that he was all I needed when he needed someone else as well as me? How could he be enough for me when I wasn't enough for him? Why did he need someone else to give him children, if I was all he needed? I stayed there through the meal, then escaped as soon as I could. I needed some time alone with the Lord. Wasn't the Lord the one who'd stopped me from conceiving? Surely the Lord would do something for me in my distress. The old priest Eli was sitting by the door of the tent of worship where I stood before the Lord. I wept and wept. I couldn't control myself. I poured out my heart. I asked the Lord to look on my misery, to remember me and not forget me. I knew God had rescued our people where before when they cried out in distress in Egypt. God had seen our misery in slavery there. And God remembered us and brought us out of our distress. Would God do it again? Would God remember me in my need? Would giving me a son be part of God's good purpose? 
I made a vow that if God did give me a son, I would give him back, dedicate him to God, so that his life would be used for God's purposes, whatever God wanted. As I stood there, I didn't have the heart to pray aloud, as people usually did. As I poured out my bitterness to God, my lips formed the soundless words. Eli, the priest, noticed me. I was surprised that he didn't understand that I was praying in the silence of my heart. He accused me of making a drunken spectacle of myself and told me to stop drinking. I know some people ate and drank a bit much at those festivals and maybe that's why he was keeping an eye on things. But I hadn't even wanted to eat, let alone drink. At least Eli understood when I told him. No, sir, I said, I'm not drunk. I'm deeply troubled and distressed. I've been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Who else can understand or can help me? I've been telling God all about it. I'm desperate, not drunk. Finally, Eli understood that I'd been praying to the Lord. He prayed too that the God of Israel would grant, grant my request and he told me to go in peace. His prayer reminded me that the Lord was indeed the God of Israel, one who always remembered his, and cared for his people. This strengthened my confidence and I returned composed. Having left my anxieties with the Lord, I was now able to eat and drink with my husband. Sometime after we returned home, I knew that the Lord had remembered me among his people. In due course, I conceived and my joy was complete when I had a baby boy. I don't know why God hadn't given me a child before this, nor why God doesn't always answer other childless women with a baby. All I know is that I was helpless and hopeless and God met me in my need. I was filled with thanks and wonder at the way God had transformed my situation. It was I who gave my son his name, Samuel, because I asked the Lord for him. Now you may think that my Hebrew was a bit strange. Since he was asked for, you'd think I would have called him Saul, which means just that, asked for. Samuel actually means God hears. But I called him Samuel because I asked the Lord for him. And as it turned out, the birth of my son Samuel set in train a sequence of events which led to Saul becoming king. Just like me, our people were in desperate need. Helpless before the Philistine armies oppressing us, we asked God to give us a king to save us. Saul, our first king, was the one asked for. And my son Samuel was the one God used to anoint Saul as king and then to take from him the kingship and to give it to another. God answered my helpless prayer, not only for my sake, but for the sake of our helpless people. God was working out a bigger purpose beyond my needs, a purpose that extended far beyond our little lives. You know, it's amazing how our little lives fit into God's bigger purpose. The next few years I didn't go up to Shiloh for the yearly sacrifice. I waited until Samuel was old enough and then I took him to Eli to serve in the presence of the Lord and live there in the place of worship. My husband Elkanah was happy with my decision to wait till then. He assured me that the Lord would help me to do what I promised. Our children could be five or six before we weaned them completely so Samuel was with me in his growing years. You can imagine how I told him about the Lord and prepared him for what was to come. It was a big day when we all went up to Shiloh again. 
We took a prize bull, a bag of flour and a skin of wine to give thanks to the Lord. After the sacrifice and meal, we took Samuel to Eli. I reminded Eli of the time he found me praying to the Lord and told him how the Lord had granted my prayer. I told him how God had given Samuel to me and now I was lending him to the Lord for the rest of his life. As long as he lives, I said, he is given to the Lord. I won't tell you how I felt going home that time. I trusted that the Lord who had given him to me would look after Samuel. Of course, I thought about him a lot. I made a new outfit for him and took it up to Shiloh each year when we went up to offer the sacrifice. Eli always blessed us and prayed for Elkanah and me. He especially asked that the Lord would give us other children. And would you believe it? The Lord remembered me again. He gave me three more sons and two daughters. Once I had no children. Then God gave me six altogether. How God turns things around. God is always turning things around. God changed my life completely. Do you remember my song of praise? God gave such joy and strength to an ordinary woman like me, powerless in my situation, humiliated by my rival and overwhelmed with distress. Will you join me in saying the words of my song? My heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in my God. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is no holy one like you, O Lord, nor any rock like you, our God. For you are a God of knowledge, and by you our actions are weighed. I experience the way God turns things around. God blesses the most unlikely people, ordinary people like me. I was down and God raised me up. God gives strength to the weak. God brings down the, power, the proud and arrogant and God raises up the humble and weak. As my song goes, the bows together of the mighty are broken but the feeble gird on strength. Those who were full now search for bread, but those who were hungry are well fed. The barren woman has borne sevenfold, but she who has many children is forlorn. Obviously, my song went far beyond my personal situation. As you know, God gave me six children, not seven. And when I sang this song, I only had one son whom I'd given to the Lord. Even so, I felt complete with the completeness that seven children represents. And my song continues praising God for raising up those who are poor and needy. Together, both the poor and the rich are of your making. You bring low and you also exalt. You raise up the poor from the dust and lift the needy from the sheep. You make them sit with rulers and inherit a place of honour. For the pillars of the earth are yours and on them you have set the world. God raised me up. God blesses the most unlikely, ordinary people. You might think the last line of that song that we just said is a bit odd about the pillars of the earth. Have you seen pillars, the earth on pillars? We talked about the world the way we saw it. The sky above, the earth, and then the waters below, the waters above as well. So we understood there must be pillars or columns to hold it all up. God created this world and we knew that our God, who made the world by his great power, could give power and strength to those he chose. God chooses to bless and to use the most unlikely people, 
like me. Who would have thought that I, a simple country woman, would know God's goodness and be used to fulfil God's purposes? God uses ordinary people. Who would have thought that my dear son Samuel would be used to fulfil God's purposes? Who would have thought that God would work through our people to accomplish his purposes in the world? Or who would have thought he'd work through David, who became our king? Or Mary, who would one day bear his son? As you know, Mary's song was very like mine. I think she might have used some of my words when she sang her song. Mary, a young girl in a most unlikely situation, was told that God would give her the son who would complete God's purposes for the world. God's purposes of salvation. Like me, Mary burst into a song of praise. You might know it as the Magnificat or tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord. Proud hearts and stubborn wills are put to flight, the hungry fed, the humble lifted high. Who would have thought that God would send his son to live with human weakness and to die because of human sin? How God turned things around and raised him up who would have thought God would use the message of the cross, what greater sign of weakness and humiliation, to save those who believe? For God's weakness is greater than human strength. God showed his power in me, in my weakness and humiliation, as an infertile woman. But as you know, when God answered my prayer and Samuel was born, God's purposes went far beyond me and my little family. God's concern has always been for the whole world. And God, as always, was about setting things right for the whole world, judging the ends of the earth. That's what the last line of my song says, which we missed out on saying. Let's do it now. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed. Raising up a king was part of God's plan to set things right. God's king was the one anointed for God's purposes. My story was the beginning of what God would do to raise up his king to save us from Philistine oppression. God would judge our world by destroying our enemies and setting us free. God did it through the king he raised up, our great king David. But the story has some twists and turns before it gets to David. You can read about it in the book named after my son Samuel. Fancy my story being the first one in the book. God fulfills his purposes through ordinary people like me. And you know, more than I did then, how God's story moved forward with many ups and downs from our King David to King David's greatest son, the King of Kings, Jesus. Jesus born in weakness, dying in shame, raised in triumph and coming again in glory how God turns things around. I wonder if you know how God's power is made perfect in weakness, how God's good purposes for blessing others are being worked out through people like you. I was a most unlikely person to know God's love and power, a very ordinary woman used by God to accomplish his purposes for blessing through the birth of my son Samuel. I learned that I could trust God and his love for me in every situation in life. It was not my own strength and power that would see me through, but God's. I do hope that is true for you as it was for me. Thank you for listening to my story. Let's pray. 
And in the silence, maybe bring to God anything that's come to you as your own story has connected with Hannah's. Lord, may your word live in us and bear much fruit to your glory.